If you could buy a nice, simple, basic air rifle just like this for next to nothing, would you? Should you? Welcome back to Canna Care. I think I explained in an earlier video that uh, when I was a preteen teenager, our dads were able to uh, buy us honest to goodness steel and wood pellet guns, air rifles for $20 or less. Um, this gun is pretty much one of those. It is a little bit later. I think this one was made in the 1980s from the fellow I got it from. He said that's when he got it. Um, it is marked rather nicely on here and rather uh, honestly Chinese. This is a Model 61 Shanghai China with Chinese characters above that. Nowadays it's quite common for us to see uh, Chinese products with all sorts of um, Western branding on them and things like that to make them uh, look like something they're, they're really not. But uh, this is a product of China and they were proud to uh, sell it as such. And it's pretty inexpensive when it was when it was new and uh, my goodness what would it be like to get a bargain like that nowadays I mean twenty dollars for an air rifle well guess what they actually still make it this is as far as I can tell pretty much the same gun just some 40 years later this gun is sold still being sold, I believe. I can believe you can still get them from one of our local hardware chains and it has no name on it. Very generic. There is a serial number, probably to comply with something. It has no markings to say that it was made in China or anything. At least I haven't found them yet. I'll, uh, I'll break it down at some point and see what we can find, but clearly a Chinese air rifle. The wood is gone. Synthetic stock. Um but still pretty much all the same steel parts. It looks very, very much the same gun. Um, probably a few changes have crept in over the years, but uh, what do you suppose they sell these things for? Yeah, $39.95, 40 bucks. That is less than what, in adjusted for inflation dollars, this one would have cost back when it was new. Um, in some ways, they're a heck of a bargain, and the fact you've got something you can actually go out and shoot. Trouble is, do they leave you wanting something more? Are they just a little bit, a little bit too much drained out of the pool to, to fully enjoy? Um, that's a good question. We should get into them and find out a bit more. I think what I'll do is I'll tear them down and see if they are in fact the same gun or pretty sure they are. Then we'll just find out what makes them really different. But before I start tearing them down completely, let's just go over what we've got here with this earlier gun. We do have a wood stock with a metal trigger guard, stamped sheet metal trigger, a stamped sheet metal cocking lever, which rattles like crazy. It does have sling swivels on it, which the newer gun does not have. They also rattle around a little bit, but if you think about it, they're not entirely useful. Um, yeah, you could throw a sling on it and carry it over your shoulder for sure, but if you want to use your sling as a bit of a brace in shooting, they're on the wrong side of the gun for a right-handed person. right-handed person would want the slings here, so you could wrap it around your arms and tighten the gun up into your, into your, uh, for your hold, steady it up a little bit. These are on the other side. I've, uh, seen some instances where people have actually removed them and put them on the other side just to make some sense out of it all. Um... Not sure what the explanation is for that. It's kind of interesting. Um, one criticism of Chinese-made budget air guns is that the stocks are often of fairly atrocious quality. This one's not too bad. Um, actually looks kind of nice. People often caution you about trying to uh, strip off the finish that came with them and try to redo them because you'll find out that finish is, uh, hides a lot of uh, horrible things underneath. You'll notice right down the bottom here a couple of spots. That's actually wood filler. That's not very much. I do understand that uh, quite a few of the Chinese rifles that were made with wood stocks in the 1990s and later, huge chunks of wood filler keep the thing together. So, um, yeah, maybe the synthetic stock was uh, a more consistent um, 
use of uh, resources, I guess. The sights on this gun are kind of cool. You've got a nice hooded front sight there with a post in there. A little pin on top. Not quite sure what that's for. Um, this one has a ladder type sight on it. You lift it up to gain elevation for shooting longer distances. When I got this gun, I discovered that it shot ridiculously high no matter what the sight was set at. The sight would not bed down into the bottom groove here. I ended up Cutting this shorter, making it a bit less, uh, only, only cut it down to two teeth instead of three that were on it. And I'm actually able to slide it a bit further back and lower the sight enough that the darn thing will actually shoot close to point of aim now. Um, yeah. Definitely an issue there. I wondered if, if the barrel was bent or something, but no, no, nothing really wrong with it. I've had this gun fully apart. I did end up having to replace the piston seal in it. The original one was leather, and it was all torn up because uh, some bright spark in, a, in uh, many years ago, I guess, decided that it'd be fun, instead of shooting pellets out of it, to shoot little pieces of nails. Um, oddly enough, that is not the first gun I've come across that that's happened. Uh, needless to say, you might be able to put the nail in the barrel, but uh, when you go to try and shoot, the darn thing falls down the transfer port into the piston chamber. And uh, in this instance, all it really managed, all it managed to do was damage the uh, the piston seal. It didn't seem to score up the uh, the inside of the piston at all. So, um, anyway, put a new seal in there and got it working again. So, there we have it. But a pretty cool little gun. And um, given how inexpensive they are, you know, they are nicely made. I do have a soft spot for it, even though I haven't been able to shoot it very well, and that is disappointing. But probably to be expected. After all, you don't expect a match-grade barrel on something that uh, costs less than $20 new or even $40 today. So it was a bargain in some ways, but um, yeah. Anyway, let's have some fun with the other one and find out what we can. Well, let's get to taking these, uh, these uh, Chinese-made guns apart and see what we can uh, learn from them. Oddly enough, this gun has... Phillips crosshead type screw down here, and yet everything else appears to be slotted. Just have to remove that one there, I think. The other screw is hidden underneath here. At least from the last time I remember taking this apart. These guns, um, I do believe, are made manufacturer's name is industry brand um and it looks like they've been doing this for a long time and yeah, there we go underneath there the uh while this is uh called a shanghai model 61 it is technically i believe a what they call today a b1 air gun the uh, there are there is a b2 a b3 and a b4 and they go on from there but the one two three and four are all pretty much the same idea the b2 sold in some markets particularly in england or whatever instead of having just a straight on brake barrel opening there is instead a catch here that you push push down and it releases the barrel which is kind of handy i suppose though it doesn't make a huge difference um, the B3 is an underlever design, so the barrel being fixed, you pull down here and it opens a chamber. And the B4 is, uh, same idea, but side lever. People do caution, though, on those particular guns to be very careful of them, because that opening chamber, there's no safety catch on the gun, and, uh, they can, if by chance the trigger gets nudged or whatever, the gun can slam shut on your fingers if you're loading a pellet, so... Uh, all that being said, I think this simpler design works just fine. So here's the stock. Just straightforward wood inleted. Again, the sling swivels on the wrong side of the gun. And the usual typical um, serrated butt plate or on the back of it there. And again signs of wood filler in here to uh, 
mask the uh, fairly budget grade of the wood involved. So there you go. Put that aside. I think I'll leave this together right now and I'll pull out the other one. So synthetic stock. This has crosshead screws here, although they're actually extra slots though. And our lock washers, which fall out of the plastic. The other ones say stuck in the wood, but they're still there. Okay. And one big one down here. This gun, I don't believe, has ever been apart before, so I've had the other one apart. When I uh, when I first got it, I discovered that the, the piston seal was completely shot. So this is marked HH17.10. Not sure what that means. Obviously, it's on production code. Nice, straightforward synthetic stock, and it includes a trigger guard, of course, so... Yeah. One big difference on the two guns I kind of noticed was the... Uh, much higher comb on the synthetic stock. Very much designed for using the rifle with a scope. Um, this is also slightly longer butt stock, at least going by the trigger. Otherwise, you'd be able to ch interchange these two uh, these stocks, I do believe. Let's just give that a try here. Will that fit right in there? Not quite. This plastic piece on the back appears to be a little bit bigger, a little thicker likely than the uh, than the metal one on the on the earlier gun. Yes, it is, but maybe a quarter inch longer at least. So, yeah, that's you couldn't swap the stocks easily without uh, doing a bit of cutting. But, but otherwise, yeah, pretty much the same basic idea. As you see, the two mechanisms are pretty much the same same thing. Uh, it just comes off, doesn't it? Maybe this one's this too, I can't remember. Windage adjustment on these guns is by tapping the front sight back and forth. Elevation is by this little ladder mechanism. Pretty sticky on this one here. This one was terrible. Uh, the notches just did not line up and I couldn't get the rear sight low enough. So I took it apart a couple of times and ended up, uh, ends up being able to get it working a bit more satisfactory. This gun, I'm pretty sure this new one needs a good cl thorough cleaning. Um, yeah, okay. So you might see some refinements here. See what we can find out. Let's pull it apart further. Well, this is interesting and unexpected. This screw right here, which is the, uh, the one that clamps the, well, go, it provides the axis for the barrel and then also provides a bit of clamping force to keep the barrel snug in its forks, not loose. This screw only backs off about a half a turn and then comes to a complete stop. So, at some point, this thing has been damaged or peened in its assembly at the factory. And, uh, making it coming apart almost impossible. So you know what? I'm going to give up on it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, this uh, rifle does technically work and functions. So I'm going to tighten this down to the point where the barrel is still loose. Barrel is decently slug, snug in its forks, and then put it back together in its stock. So that—that that I guess is one lesson in buying air rifles on a budget. They can end up they can end up being somewhat unserviceable and partly disposable, I guess. Ah, uh, this would come out, I suppose, eventually. Um, it really doesn't want to turn much, though. Still too loose. I put it back in my vise to tighten it down the rest of the way. 
Another thing you might really notice about both these guns is how incredibly droopy they are. Um, even though they've been made 40 years apart, they still use in the same playbook at the factory. Um, put a straight edge along the top of the, uh, the piston cylinder, you can see the barrel falls away pretty drastically. Um, it's about, uh, you know, yeah, quite a bit low at that, that end. This one, this is the newer gun of the two, and same issue. Um, it's not really a big deal if you're shooting with iron sights, which is all you can do with this particular gun. You just line your eyeball up with that, and there you go, off you go. But if you put a scope on this one, which probably doesn't make sense given that the stock is clearly, clearly designed with the idea to put a scope on there. The scope sits up here, and its alignment is with the piston tube, and the barrel is pointing downhill from there, so uh, that's what's known in the business as a drooper so one way to fix that is to jack up the rear end of the scope with shims um, fiddly process less than ideal because otherwise you'll end up maxing out the, uh, the range on your scope at which point the scope will often misbehave and it uh, reaches the end of its limits it'll crosshairs will bounce around a bit you won't see it but uh, your pellets will go all over the place so um, yeah that's where we're at with that. I'm going to take put this one back in its stock since we can't get it apart any further and it's no point in uh, trying it, trying that. I'll pull this one apart to show you the basic in innards of these things and how really simple they are. Taking a gun like this apart isn't too hard. You don't, don't need any really special tools. Um, you'll notice here in this instance I don't use a spring compressor. Uh, just a clamp is enough to hold onto the spring while you pop it open. Not a lot of preload on this one so it's easy to do that. So here's the innards of our Shanghai 61 all taken down. What can we learn from it? Um, well, sad to say I wasn't able to take apart the other one. Um, I tried actually to consider uh, just trying to remove the uh, piston assembly from the gun without taking the barrel off, but I realized you do have to loosen this off to be able to disengage it out that slot. And uh, with the barrel pivot in there like that, you can't get it out. So. Anyway, what do we learn about these interesting and very, very inexpensive guns? Um, well, here's our piston, and uh, what you can't see when the gun's together is how really crude this thing is. Um, there appears to be some sort of brazing put on this side to repair it at the factory. Obviously, this it's hard to believe it was worth a while to do something like that, but they did. Um, as I said, this is my replacement leather seal. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's holding up okay. Uh, the, uh, the one that came out was, uh, way worse, so, um, did that a couple of years ago, and it's still holding up all right, although, not that I shoot this gun very much, anyway. You can see here what they call a direct sear, as in the trigger has the sear on it. That's it. There's no other interlinkage in between the two to give you a, uh, more refined trigger pull. This just literally, when the gun cocks, it latches on there like that, and that's it. It holds together until you pull the trigger and let it go. So naturally, your trigger is holding back all the force of this spring. Um, doesn't mean it's terrible. There can be some very good guns made with uh, direct sears. If they're done, done well and cleverly, it's not bad. Obviously, a more sophisticated trigger will give you better results. The piston itself, well, we've got this part just welded right on there like that. That's where the stock attaches to. Stock attaches there as well. Pretty straightforward. And uh, the nice touch on this one is the, the end cap is actually threaded on. And it's a purely decorative piece. Gun works without it. Obviously stops dirt and crud from getting down inside. But screws on like that. The newer one is just a slip-on plastic piece. You can expect that. What we can't see from the other one that I would like to have seen is what sort of piston seal we have. Presumably it'll be a synthetic on, the, on a 40-year 40, 40 newer gun. Um, yeah, it's got to be. I'd like just to see what sort of quality of seal it was, but uh, it doesn't look like I'm going to get that one apart. If it was my gun, I'd be probably a lot more determined to get into it, but uh, uh, it's not my gun, and the fellow who owns it really wouldn't care. Uh, he doesn't plan on shooting it much either. Um, one other difference between the guns, well, this one does have a leather breech seal. Um, the, the, uh, the newer gun does have synthetic, so presumably it's uh, synthetic inside as well. The barrel on this one actually has a nice taper to it. Um, measuring it up here, I'm getting 
14.9 millimeters tapers down to 13.9 um, the newer gun is just a straight straight 15 millimeters all the way down um, somebody also went to a lot of trouble to give it a little more aesthetics which would have been in probably considered appropriate in the 1980s nowadays we're used to heavier bull barrels so a straight straight wall barrel probably makes sense a little bit cheaper to make and uh, yeah um, not a problem today so there we go we'll put this thing back together again I'll probably give it a little more lubricant on my seal here and uh, clean this piston up a little bit more there's a lot of gunk on there put it back together and we'll shoot them over the chronograph see what we get okay our guns all back together again let's see if she still functions properly cocks all right try one of these crossman dome pallets and shoot it across the screens oh, I think it's four or something and the chronograph just suddenly blanked out on me let's try that again I think it was 480 something Four twenty-seven. Okay, that's pretty low. I think last time I tried this gun, it shot a bit faster. Four eighteen. For a lot of people, guns like this are the best bargain in uh, air gunning. Although, funny story, just uh, last weekend I happened to be at a gun show and uh, a fellow had a rack of air rifles there. And he had in the rack, and honest to goodness, just like this, Shanghai Model 61 Woodstock. He wanted $175 for it. I didn't have the heart to tell him that you can buy the same thing brand new for $40. You don't get the wood stock, you don't get some of the extra metal parts, but uh, you do get a gun that will mount a scope and doesn't have 40 years of uh, use and abuse on it, like the other one did, so that one required a fair bit of repair to get it going. This one, right out of the box, let's see how she shoots. There's a bit of a thunk there when it fires. That's 503. Four seventy-eight. Okay, well that was fun. Let's take him to the range and see if we can get him to shoot straight. So we start off with the Shanghai sixty-one over the over the sand uh, sandbags at uh, ten meters. I struggled first off just to get a decent sight picture. Um, my shooting glasses just squashed on the stock in an awkward way. Uh, I don't know. I just never felt really comfortable with the with the sight lineup, but uh, these uh, these Gco wide cutters actually did pretty well for a gun that um, the rear sight wobbles back and forth just a wee bit on it, as I discovered later. Um, yeah, it's not doing too badly for a gun that costs next to, next to nothing. Then I tried the uh, the B1, the new newer one that you can still buy nowadays with the synthetic stock. Again, 10 meters over the rest. And I had an even harder time lining up the sights because, of course, the higher comb on this one is suited more for a, for a scope, not the iron sights that it comes with. Bit annoying there. But it did, didn't shoot 
terribly, actually not bad. I mean, these ones are all touching. Can't, can't, can't complain about that. Eh, except that one. The RWS pellets cost a bit more. Shooting a little bit more to the left, oddly enough. And... Uh, not a terrible group, but not quite as good as the other ones, oddly enough. And uh, these JSB Expresses, which are normally a very good pellet in a lot of guns, just didn't seem to work very well. I was getting a pretty bad spread, but again, I complain that the my, my sight picture wasn't everything it should have been. So I stuck a scope on the gun, just a basic 4x32, and uh, gave a shot at that one. Um, did sight it in, 20 yards, and oh my gosh, um, you can tell what's happening here. The scope is maxed out on its uh, adjustments, and it's throwing them Obviously, the reticle is just bouncing around inside it, and we got, they're all on a fairly straight line, but 98 millimeters from top to bottom. So all told, uh, where do I stand with these guns? They're cheap. Um, well, assuming you don't pay 175 bucks at a, at a gun show. But if you buy one brand new for $40 today, you can stick a scope on it and hopefully find a scope that will work properly. And that, and therein lies the problem. You're going to spend 60 to $80 for a scope, $40 for the rifle, so you've got $120 all told in it. For just a little bit more money, you could have a Crossman Optimus, you could have maybe a Stoger. Uh, they come with a scope that's probably well suited to it. Um, have to say, uh, that's a better bet, I think, than, uh, than going with these very affordable and very attractively priced guns, but at the end of the day, you do suffer a little bit. I do want to like them, uh, they're a nice size, they're a nice weight, they seem to be an ideal pellet rifle design, but yeah, there's there's just not enough there, I think, to um, get too serious and too excited about using one. So yeah, save your pennies, buy something a little bit better, I think that's my conclusion. In the meantime, thanks for watching, consider subscribing, and I'll be back with some more fun stuff soon.